Today I am going to assemble a chocolate cake and the ingredients are milk, flour, sugar, butter, cocoa powder, uh, capacitor, choke resistor, single phase AC electric motor, planetary gear, intermediate and penultimate gears, pinions, shim washers, aluminium die castings, a light dusting of screws and washers and two eggs. These are the 235 components of a Kenwood Chef A701A food mixer. A literal revolution, hundreds of them per minute in fact, in domestic cooking. And I'm going to put them back together. And we're going to start with the electric motor since that is what separates this from the pestle and mortar. So I'll need the armature, a fan, some coils, the casing, a couple of brush holders and brushes, and three wavy washers. That should keep me going until you turn over to a soap. Now, you are going to have to bear with me a bit on this one because when the office said, what sort of food mixer would you like to reassemble? I said, what's a food mixer? It's completely uncharted territory, although it does contain some things that I know about. Electric motors, bit of soldering, I imagine. Um, screws, washers, you know, all that stuff. As a younger man, I used to think, wouldn't it be funny if there was actually somebody in the world who was called Ken Wood? which wouldn't be an uncommon name, and he happened to be a chef. So he became Ken Wood, comma, chef. But it turns out that Ken, Ken Wood, I thought it was Sir Alexander Kenwood, but it's not, he was called Ken Wood, so he named his company Ken Woods. <laughs> I think he also had a boat that he named Ken Wood. I've never made a cake before. I've never really done any baking. I'm not much of a cook, to be honest. I can do sort of, you know, Shepherd's pie, cottage pie, chicken and ham pie, leek and potato pie. The brush holders are connected. If you look at this, I can't help noticing well, this is a piece of the motor which is deep in the bowels of the mixing experience, but it does appear to have a bit of old cake on it. It's disgusting, but it could be from the 70s. I think this machine is from about 1971, 1972. So that could be the birthday cake of someone who's an old man or woman by now. It's covered in cake. Look at it. It's caked with cake. The basic idea of an electric motor is very simple. You put electricity in one end and it rotates the shaft at the other. And that's it. You can then take the shaft and attach it to whatever you like. And once I've finished constructing this motor, I'll connect ours to the paddle, which will mix our chocolate cake mix. I haven't delved into the bowels of very many domestic electrical appliances from this or any era. I would say this is a huge electric motor. Oh yes, that feels rather good. That's a fantastic invention. Imagine all the things that would be incredibly tedious hard work. We'd have no power tools, we'd have no electric cars, no electric trains, no battery operated sex toys. They'd all be clockwork. Imagine that if you had to stop and wind it up. I'm afraid it's wound down, madam. It's Or sir. I mean, I'm not, I'm not. <laughs> Thankfully, this is not clockwork, but an electric motor, and it's starting to look like one. Good. Let's just check that it still spins, and it does. There you go. Single phase AC electric motor. A rather massive thing, isn't it? But it's quite nice. Best motor they ever made that. That lasts for a thousand years. I mean, just put these rubber grommets in because that's. It somehow mounts through those, although I haven't quite worked out how yet, but. I can hear you screaming, poke it with the screwdriver. Yes, but I'm trying not to. There's an 
excellent opportunity for stabbing yourself with a screwdriver. So there's still a bit more of electric motor to do, which involves a bit more casing, that bit. Plus we need two more washers and two more screws. That'll probably do for now because I'm, well, this will take me a while. It did take a while, but one hour and seven minutes after I began, the motor is almost assembled and the casing in place. Now I can attach the fan, which also helps regulate the speed of the motor. Oh. This screwdriver is one of the most fantastic things I've ever owned. I know that suggests I've had a very sad life, and maybe I have, but you shouldn't mock the afflicted. The rule amongst people who use tools professionally is that you don't buy them until you absolutely need them. And that makes sense if it's how you make your living because obviously you diminish your living if you're spending it all on tools. If you just buy tools because you're a bit of a pervert like me, then you can invent excuses for having them. Now, this is secured with a grub screw. It's, it's going in with an Allen key and it's going to be an imperial size, I'm guessing, as this is British and quite old, but I have a set magically The imperial system harks back to, in many cases, divisions of the human body. So the foot was a foot, the inch I think was originally the end of somebody's thumb, and so on and so on. Um, the metric system is in essence divisible by 10. The imperial system, its advocates would argue, is great because it's divisible by more numbers. So if you had a shilling, it's quite easy to divide into two people's worth of money, or three people's, or four people's. One of the things I do like about the imperial system is that it's, it's more conversational, if you like. It's, a lot of the units are more easy to relate to. You can say, oh, it missed it by half an inch. You know, you, you can't really miss something by 12 and a bit millimetres. The imperial system is almost dead, really, for most things. I'll close the lid on the Imperial system and put it gently to rest on top of the small metric spanners. Right. <clears throat> I'm now just going to sit here and drink my cup of tea for a while because every other one I've had in this series has gone cold. This is metric tea. The thing to remember about the great debate between metric and imperial units is they don't actually change the amount of beer or the lengths of footpaths or the heights of aeroplane above the earth. It's just a different way of expressing it. They're just units. They're just a means of understanding. You could measure them in, in lengths of Richard Hammond if you wanted to. The aeroplane is 28,000 Richard Hammonds above the earth. As long as we agreed on what a Richard Hammond was, it doesn't matter. It means the same thing. Then you could convert that to meters or feet or furlongs or things to do with the frequency of light. Doesn't matter. Next up is the speed control unit of my food mixer. For this, I'll need a switch, a couple of retaining screws, a mounting plate and a capacitor. That's a capacitor. I'll blow my head off later. That's it. Holy moly, look at all this. It's going to be some soldering in a minute. I hate soldering. Do you know what? Look, looking at this thing, I am quite curious to use one. There's a great advert that says... I mean, I hardly dare repeat it for fear of getting my balls kicked off by the sisterhood. I'm not saying this. I'm quoting the advert, OK, which is from the 60s, I believe. And it says something like, the Kenwood chef does everything except the cooking. That's what wives are for. But just to reiterate, I'm not saying that, and I'm not saying I agree with it. I don't agree with it. I'm, I'm merely quoting it. It's a historical document. I can also tell you some things that Hitler said. It doesn't mean I'm a Nazi. It just means I happen to know what he said. Now I can clip these bits together and attach the capacitor. It's sort of like a little temporary battery. It stores a bit of electricity and then releases it when you need it. 
That's a fairly reasonable definition of a capacitor. That's why they're a bit, a bit dangerous to muck about with because you can think you've turned something off and you have, and there's no electricity going into it, but there's some electricity hiding in it. It's like a little electrical booby trap. Get in, you horrible metal. I think we may be approaching the inevitable hour, which is what Thomas Gray might have been talking about had he gone to an electronic workshop rather than a country churchyard. We're going to have to do some soldering. Right. Plug in the soldering iron. Now, it takes about five minutes for that to warm up. I'm appealing to the editors of this programme not to cut around this because it will probably be the first time in television history that a soldering iron has been seen to warm up in real time. And why should we deny that that happens? The people who produce this show think I'm stupid and that I don't realise what they're doing. I actually, I'm so familiar with their editing techniques, the Rachmaninoff starts in my head as I'm doing certain things. I, I know it's there. I'm not going to let you edit round this. If you're one of those amateur electronics, enthusiasts or even a professional electrical engineering type person this is the point where you go on to twitter and complain about my soldering so just do it now i'll do it for you if you want you need to say something like i didn't think much of james may's soldering and why did he dip the end of the lick the iron in the flux ha now get out of this one it's not on at the wall <laughs> <laughs> I can put off soldering in so many ways. I've just had a thought. I've been given... I'm dying to try this out. I've been given this. This is a gift. And I suspect it's been given to me with the intention of making me look like a total knob. But what it is, it's a head-mounted magnifying system. So you get, you get a selection of lenses you need to put your glasses on to read the thing that tells you what size the lenses are. 2.5. I'm going to try 2.5. So I can't see a thing over there, but if I look down there... Wow, that's amazing! There's a light on it, isn't there, somewhere? How do you switch that on? Is that...? Yeah, look. How cool do I look? If I wear it down the pub, will I score, do you think? <laughs> I, can't, I can't work out where the cupboard is. But... <laughs> this is not only about looking good, it's also about accurate soldering of capacitor to speed controller plate. That's brilliant. Look at that's the best soldered joint I've ever done. Okay, now let's try glasses and the magnifier. It's massive. <laughs> I can read tiny writing and all sorts of things. The next piece to go on is the on off switch, and this is an excuse to use my favourite screwdriver. It holds the screw. It doesn't hold the washer, unfortunately. <laughs> Bugger. Everything in the world is somewhere. As the findologists like to say, it's not lost, you are. Ah. Uh, washers have several functions. They spread the load thus protecting delicate materials and finishes. They also help to lock screws in place. If you have spring washers, for example, or wavy washers, you also use washers as shims to pack things up, things that don't line up 
correctly. After a jaunty four hours and 23 minutes, I've built the AC motor and added the fan and the on-off switch. I've also reassembled the speed control board and attached it to the motor. So, I can move on. Now, as the motor is, it is just a motor with a rotating shaft. It needs to transfer all that drive to the gearbox and everything else. So that requires a belt system, a toothed belt. We don't need the belt yet, but we do need the belt pulley, that little retaining ring. These four screws. So this is the, the, uh, the drive belt pulley, which mounts on the other end of the motor with a roll pin, which is going to be slightly tricky because you would normally have a sort of roll pin squeezer to do this, which I don't have, so we'll improvise slightly. The first Kenwood Chef was launched in 1950. I appeal is by appeal, said Ken Wood himself. He recognised quite early on, actually, that attractive domestic appliances would sell better than ugly ones. And we still see that today, don't we, with sort of designer fridges and those trendy Italian tin openers and lemon squeezers and what have you. And the first one sold out within a week from Harrods. It was probably considered quite a posh thing because I think in today's money it cost the equivalent of something like £600. I think that has lined up. Let's try squeezing it with pliers, even though my instincts tell me that's not quite right. Oh, there you go, that's bloody perfect. That is the entire electric motor, the belt pulley and the speed control unit and the uh, connection to the mains complete. And more joyously, we can move on to something that I like and understand, the gearbox. News has just reached me from the sadists who put this program together that I haven't finished the electric motor. There are some other bits, so we'll do that again. Well, that's the electric motor almost finished. Just a few more bits to put on. I can joyously head back to the table to get the final bits of the motor. I can then blissfully attach the knob and Ken's name badge to finally complete the AC electric motor. It looks like some sort of weird satellite from an old sci-fi film, doesn't it? You can imagine that floating around in space with some theremin music. The point about the food mix, though, I suppose, is, I mean, I'm all in favour of old technology being discarded because new technology is better. That's part of progress. We mustn't be held back by trying to hang on to things because they made them properly in the olden days. But the point about a food mixer is, Regardless of what's going on inside the box, what it actually does is very simple. It provides a number of rotating shafts to drive appliances and it has a whisky thing that goes around in a bowl. That basic principle has probably been around since the Egyptians. Something has to go around in a bowl to stir things up. This has merely mechanised the process. So, on the basis that it's quite difficult to improve on the idea of a basic food mixer, we may as well stick with this one. That is, the motor and the controls and the knob and the connectors all definitely finished and we can move on to something that I'm much happier with, the gearbox. I'm looking forward to this bit. There's no soldering in it for one thing. Right, now I'm going to remove from the table everything in this line here, which is the gearbox. And I like the idea of the gearbox because I understand gears. They can be considered levers in circular form. They're important if you ride a bicycle, drive a car, have a food mixer, play spirograph, all sorts of things. Look at that lovely thing. I know that's going to feel nice with some grease on it somewhere. Oh, likewise that. Nice little pinion. Hours of fun. Hours. What I find interesting about gears is this shape on the teeth. That's taken a long time for humankind to arrive at a shape that meshes like that. It's extremely complicated, actually, if you analyse it right down to the Euclidean details. 
that's sort of the legacy of many, many centuries of refinement and thought in geometry, metalworking, arithmetic. Amazing. Anyway, how does it go together? Let's find out. Right, I don't, I don't know how this goes, but it ought to be possible to work it out because it's a gearbox. This bit, I'm guessing, given that that has an annular gear, is a, an epicyclic of some sort, because I know when the food mixer goes round and round, it goes round whilst going round. It is epicyclic. It is something going round inside something that is in itself going round. Um, so I imagine there will be some planetary wheels inside there and some sort of sun arrangement. I'm fairly confident that that goes in there. Let me just work out how it all goes together. The epicyclic movement, I think we can probably already see it. You see the, that's the driver for the big K-shaped food mixer. That is going round inside something that is in itself going round. And that is possible because, oh, I'm gonna have to pull it apart again, aren't I? The whole thing is being rotated by that shaft, which has a flat on it, which locates in there, so that that's always in the same position relative to that shaft. But the end of the holder for the K is on a gear wheel, which is running in that annular gear wheel there. So it goes round while going round. Is that clear? It's a, it's a little bit confusing. If you play the spirograph a lot, it'll be a bit more easy to grasp. That runs in a nice bush. I'm still going to put a slight smear of grease on it. We'll make this the greasing finger. Oh, look at that going down. I'm wondering if this is as interesting to watch on television as it is for me to do, because when you sit down at the bench with that pile of bits, you think, oh, God, how am I going to work this out? But then once you start doing it, it's a bit like a sort of chess problem or something. You know there must be an answer, and you just have to work it out. And I believe I've gone some way to working it out, so I'm feeling incredibly pleased with myself. Now, look, you all want me to say something about how I love using lubricant or something like that. I know you do, and then you can tweet about it and go, oh, he said, you know, but I'm, so I'm not going to. Having said that, lubrication is incredibly important. If things aren't to wear out, overheat, be destroyed by friction. The interesting thing about oil and grease, the oil in the engine of your car, for example, because the oil is there, no two metal parts actually touch each other. They're separated by oil, and the layer of oil could be a molecule thick, even. But if you take the engine of a car, it will last for, what, 200,000 miles? That's not unusual. If you ran it without any oil in it, it would probably last maybe a minute. That's how important oil is. What it is making me think, actually, as I do this, is how difficult, sophisticated cooking are you making all those cake mixes and batter and whatever else must have been before machines like this were available? I mean, it must have just taken, like laundry, I suppose, before washing machines were created. It would have just taken days and days of work. I mean, for some people in big posh houses, I suppose it was actually a living doing these things. Well, here's the thing. This is what bothers me. Labour saving. It started with things like this. So cooking becomes easier, mowing the lawn becomes easier, getting about becomes easier because you have bicycles and motorcycles and cars and so on. And then we had the digital revolution. And then the microprocessor and the computer meant that we could work out fantastically complicated things and produce charts and diagrams and drawings that would have taken days or weeks to do on a drawing board or with a piece of paper and a pen, and there's all this time that's been saved by all these things, but where's it gone? By rights, we should all be sitting at home learning to paint or play the violin or philosophizing or something, but we're not. We're still running around like idiots, tending to the very machines that were supposed to save us. Where is all this time we were promised? Where is the leisure society? It's full of people having heart attacks.
Time-saving devices free up time to spend with other time-saving devices, like video games or reassembling things, which worked perfectly well before somebody took them apart. In the interest of reassembling this previously perfectly good thing, I just need to apply some silicon sealant. Then I can fit the two halves together. That is together. You can tell that is together because the silicon is evenly squeezed out all round. We can go ahead and put the screws in though. But what a pleasing thing that is, isn't it? And it's more pleasing for knowing what's going on inside it. You've seen all those all those inner workings, all those mysterious bits that most people never see and never even imagine. What you see is just a paddle going around and around and around, stirring up cake mixture. It's sort of fairly boring, really. But once you've seen it in its nakedness, disassembled, and you've had to put it back together, you know what's actually going on. You'll never look at one of these in the same way again. You'll say, ah, yes, that's going to be some chocolate brownies, thanks to a planetary gear system. I'll have a tiny little bit of goo on that shaft, just out of politeness. That goes on there. This is the little clever dog clutch bit. The end of the shaft with the pinion on that drives the gearbox is threaded. So this, this is a dog clutch. It's a clutch that engages, not progressively like the multi-plate clutch of a car, say. This has simply got flat bits which go clunk onto other flat bits. It's nice, isn't it? Right, there's the flat on there, there's the flat in the epicyclic hub. That is an iron-on washer. That is the securing nut, which will have to be nipped up. I thought that was 5 eighths. it's not quite, but anyway. That's the main gearboxy bit of it done. I enjoyed that. Mechanisms. They're nice. Super. In the mere blink of an eye, which just happened to last for seven hours and one minute, I've rebuilt not only the motor, but also the gearbox, which I now have to fill with grease to ensure that all those moving parts remain lubricated for the next 50 years. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, Could be a new form of aerobics. It's a handy little blob of grease which will keep, could be useful. That's tragic, isn't it? I mean, people save screws and things, but actually saving blobs of grease. That's a useful blob of grease. Keep it in an old cornflakes box. Right, that is the gearbox and the motor complete. They are quite esoteric, really. We can now move on to bits that start to make it look like something you'd expect to find in your kitchen. Namely, the pedestal, as it's called, the sort of chassis of the thing. Evil looking spring, look at that. The motor housing. And these bits. Follow me. Something that people don't realise about these food mixers, if you look underneath there, that is open. The point of the feet is to elevate it slightly above the worktop of your kitchen. It allows air to circulate. The motors of these things and the control units get very hot. So if you don't have the rubber feet on, the air won't get in, it will overheat, burn out, and then you'll have to have well, somebody will have to do to yours what I'm doing to this one now, i.e. take it to bits and put it back together again. The feet, I've looked this up, cost about three quid for a set. They wear out, people don't bother to replace them, they ruin the whole machine. Now, this next bit, I'm advised, can be a bit tricky. This is the, the little arm that stops the whole thing falling apart completely when you open it up. I'm sure it has a name, I don't know what it is. That will go through there, through the spring. And you have to 
keep the spring out of the way while that goes on. Piece of cake. Don't know what all the fuss was about. Now watch as this becomes even more of a Kenwood mixer. And I think a gentle tap. That is an interference fit. There is a tube to go inside it. So that would go like so. And then the pin would feed through from that side until that groove for the circlip appears on the other side, which I think it just did. I am now going to mount the motor assembly which is pretty much complete, but we need a few other bits. And they are this orangey bit. That is the motor shroud. We need these screws and lock nuts. Okay, now this isolates the motor from the rest of the mount. So let's Then it can only go one way around because the knob goes through the hole. Now, that is the motor shroud which goes over there, but before that can go over there, that bar has got to come, the strut has got to come up and locate onto there, so you drop that in there first and release that. and bring that up and attach that to that. Then we can slide the cowling up and screw it into position. I think that, um, we may have arrived at an important moment. That is quite pleasing. It's a hell of a spring in there. Now, I do believe we can put the gearbox assembly onto there. Now, that really does look like a food mixer then, doesn't it? Without taking a modern food mixer apart, I don't really know how different it would be from this one. I mean, the mechanical aspects of it, I imagine, would be exactly the same, because gears are gears. I mean, the thing is, we have this idea that stuff in the past lasted a long time, but that's because we can only see the stuff that's lasted a long time. We forget about all the stuff that we threw away because it was rubbish. So it could be that in the 70s, food mixers were built to last a long time, and it might be that today, um, kitchen knives are being made of steel that will sharpen forever and last a very long time, so that another generation can say, oh, this isn't made properly, not like it was in the good old days. Look at my old kitchen knife. I've had that for 50 years. Yes, you have, but everything else you had 50 years ago is long gone to landfill because it was rubbish. Most of us only really know what happened based on what we can see. So therefore, medieval England was just full of cathedrals. It must have been amazing. It could be that the thing that survives is the reassembler. And if that's all that archaeologists can find in 50,000 years' time, they'll say it was a strange age of man when people put things together. We're not sure what these things were. One of them was a food mixer. It lasted 50 years, you know. They don't make them like they used to. It's going to get a few more pieces. It's very, very close now to being complete. I'm going to need the belt to transfer the drive from the motor to the gearbox. This plate, this plate, and that, and that's it. Right. That is a toothed belt. That is a bit like the final drive of a large Harley Davidson. That's looking quite good, but what is vital is that when this piece is on the top, the motor is exactly central so that that drive piece, which is for one of the attachments, doesn't rub against it. That's pretty good. I'd love to be able to cook properly. I imagine it can't be entirely impossible to learn because 
a huge number of people in the world can cook. Well, that makes a good comedy noise, doesn't it? That goes on top. Thus, I had never thought until now very carefully about what actually went on inside a food mixer. If you'd asked me, I'd have said, well, there must be some gears of some sort and there must be an electric motor, but I, I wouldn't have known. And it's all, it's all rather tragically hidden, actually. What a pity you can't see it. What if they made all of this transparent so that you could watch all the gears going round and round? That would be fantastic. See, the Victorians, because they were so very excited about it, the things they'd achieved with cast iron and so on, they put it all on display in places like Kew Gardens and King's Cross Station. They wanted you to see it and marvel at it. But then later on, we decided that you shouldn't see how things worked, apart from a, a brief period in the 90s where see-through computers were quite fashionable. And then we got to the point where we decided you shouldn't see how things go together. So quite a lot of things like smartphones and tablets, although if you look very, very carefully, you can see some very, very tiny screws on them. On the whole, you're supposed to look at it as a, a sort of organic hole, as if it sprang from the earth as an entity. They don't want you to see that it went together. They do the same with the interiors of cars. You used to see screws and fixtures all over them, but now they're just a wall of stuff. And you think, well, how did that go together? The answer is that a lot of it clips together. The clips have become quite sophisticated and quite difficult to dismantle. Not that you should really want to take your car apart. That really is a fool's errand. Turn this upside down. have an excuse, at least on these front screws, to use one of my favourite screwdrivers, which is this long Phillips one. It's nice. I normally think of it as a carburetor screwdriver. It's good for reaching deep into the bowels of something big. So I'll have to find a stubby, or at least a little one. There. I am genuinely now, having been slightly ambivalent about the food mixer when we started, I'm genuinely excited to see it going round and round. That's so close. Almost there. This time I need to get the bits to attach the flex. Close machine. Invert machine. Now, do I know what I'm actually doing here. Let's have a think. Yes, that is the, the flex, as I still quite like to call it, because I like the word flex. Oh, get in, you... The washer's supposed to go over the cable and it always ends up underneath it. It's a sort of sod's law of wiring things up. Brown is live, blue is not. Green and yellow earth the lot. That maxim's rubbish, because you can say it exactly the wrong way and it still works, doesn't it? Red is live, green is not, blue and brown, yeah. And now, the crowd goes quiet as the flex is thread through the hole at the back of the Kenwood mixer. So that cable is twice clamped just in the back of the machine. Because of course it will also be clamped in the plug. You could probably swing from a suspension bridge by this machine and you'd be absolutely fine. That's so satisfying. Nice, big, clunky noises. That's a big, clunky noise. Oh, give us a break. Come on. The, the production have actually dismantled the plug. I mean, that wasn't really necessary. People know what a plug's like. Tonight, on the reassembler, something you've done yourself a million times. Might as well do tying shoelaces if we're going to do plugs. Did you know, before the establishment of the idea of a national grid, which was in, I think, I think it began in either 1923 or 1927, I can't remember, but there were something like 21 different plugs and sockets in London. Because all electricity was generated locally, there were very few appliances, and the people who generated the electricity often provided the appliances or made them and sold them. So they just invented, you know, round pin, square pin, three pin, one pin, 
whatever. And they've never been standardized across the world, but then things like the voltages and the frequencies haven't been standardized across the world either. So it's perhaps not surprising. We are moving on to parts of the machine now that, that help really to cement its identity. The identity being the work of Sir Kenneth Grange, the designer who did not only this, but things like the Kodak Instamatic. He did, I think he did a radio. Uh, most famously, he did the Intercity 125 train, the shape of it and the cab, I believe. And that was a fantastic looking thing. And this is what the future looked like when this was designed. It was quite minimalist. They you know, lost the curviness that you would associate with the 1950s. And we'd gone to this rather squarer form that you would eventually come to associate with most of the 1970s. That goes in there. The most important thing to remember about Sir Kenneth Grange was that he was called Ken. And you weren't really allowed to work for Ken Wood unless you were also called Ken because that would have meant renaming a lot of things, his house, his boat, his haircut, the lot. Put the handle on, like so, and then put that on top of there, like that. Fantastic, all that is left now is to put that piece of foam rubber in the bottom of there, and then that piece in there for the bowl to sit on. That is fantastic, isn't it? Look at that. You would never guess, looking at that rather simplistic, minimalist shape, just what is going on inside that thing, that motor, that gearbox, all those hundreds of screws and little bits and pieces and the release lever, epicyclic arrangement. It's all fantastic, isn't it? There it is, the Ken Wood Chef. Let's arrange it artfully for you there. Now for the penultimate visit to the table, where I can finally get the mixing paddle, which is shaped like a K for Ken. I'm guessing that goes into there, and then you lock it in position with a little nip on that. I've never done this. How does this go in? Now, of the 235 pieces that we started with, there is one left to put on. Can you guess what it is? Without it, the machine is useless or extremely messy and dangerous. At any rate, it's this. It's the bowl, look, the mixing bowl. What a wonderful thing. We are going to make a cake. My 1960s food mixer is nearly complete. The last nine hours and 32 minutes have been so enjoyable that I think in future I may take apart and reassemble all my kitchen appliances before I use them. I'll see if this one works first though. Let's begin with the all-important cocoa powder. All I have to do, remember, in the modern world is chuck it in the bowl. Sugar and flour in equal amounts. Uh, butter and milk. Two eggies. Fantastic. There you are. The motor, the speed controller, the gearbox, the K paddle, the bowl, the chassis. Most importantly, the ingredients for a cake. Does it work? It has to work, otherwise it's just gonna be a mess. To the memory of Kenneth Wood. Yes! Aha! Look at that, it really works. Well, let's find a baking tray and warm up the oven. <laughs> 